In this video, you and I get to build and verify an IPsec site-to-site -site tunnel using virtual tunnel interfaces. Let's begin. If we're going to make a cake, and make it a good cake, it's very likely we're going to have the right ingredients and we're going to follow the recipe. Well, for an IPsec site-to-site -site tunnel using virtual tunnel interfaces, here is the ingredients list for what we need. We need an Ike Phase 1 policy that's compatible on both routers. We need a transform set for the Ike Phase 2 policies that's compatible on both routers. And we need an IPsec profile that we can apply to a tunnel interface. Now regarding the tunnel interface that we're going to create on both these routers, the actual number of the tunnel interface doesn't matter too much, but it's the ingredients that really do matter. We're going to specify as part of the ingredients for both tunnels that we're using IPv4 IPsec mode. We can assign a logical IP address or we could go IP unnumbered. With IP unnumbered, we simply tell the interface that we're going to go ahead and borrow an IP address that's already on the box. So router 1 has 1.1.1.1 as a loopback. R3 has 3.3.3.3. So by using IP unnumbered, we could tell the tunnel interfaces to go ahead and borrow the current IP addresses that are assigned to each of the loopback interfaces respectively. Also on this tunnel interface, we're going to need to specify a source and destination for a site-to-site -site static tunnel. And then the beautiful IPsec profile that we created, we're going to want to apply to each of those tunnel interfaces. Now on top of that, we'd also very likely want to run a routing protocol like EIGRP or OSPF. In order for R1 to advertise its routes over to R3 and for R3 to dynamically advertise its routes over to R1. Let's begin on R1. Let's create a transform set. And in our example, let's name our transform set P2P-set. And we'll use for encryption AES-256. And for data integrity, we'll go ahead and use SHA. So those are the transforms for the Ike Phase 2 tunnel. Next, we're going to create an IPsec profile that says, OK, when this profile is applied to an interface, we want to use the transform set, the one we just created called P2P-set. On R1, I've already got an Ike Phase 1 policy configured, but if we want to verify what that policy is, we can do a show crypto isocamp policy. In the Ike Phase 1 policy, we're using AES, pre-shared key for authentication, SHA, a Diffie-Hellman group of 14 and a lifetime of 86,400 seconds. So the Ike Phase 1 policy on R1 has to be compatible with the Ike Phase 1 policy on R3. Next, let's create an interface called Interface Tunnel 1. This will be our virtual tunnel interface, and we'll specify tunnel mode IPsec IPv4. Now, for this tunnel interface, let's use IP unnumbered and say you can go ahead and borrow the IP address on loopback 0. We'll specify the source is R1's 15.0.0.1 address, which is its serial 1 slash 0. And the destination is R3's reachable address of 35003. And so for the tunnel source, we could either spell out serial 1 slash 0 or 15001. Either way would be absolutely fine. And regarding this beautiful IPsec profile, we want to apply that right here to this tunnel interface. And the syntax for that would be tunnel protection IPsec profile and the name of our IPsec profile. Now regarding a routing protocol, let's go ahead and throw in EIGRP Autonomous System 777. I'll do no auto summary, even though that's the default for iOS 15. And I'll add the network statements for the 10 network and the 1 network. And that will include the interface connected to 10.1.1, as well as the loopback, which also begins with the 1. And because our tunnel interface is borrowing that address, the tunnel interface itself will also be enabled for EIGRP. So let's make a road trip over to R3, and we'll apply a very similar configuration there. So here on R3, let's go into configuration mode and let's create our transform set. The actual name doesn't matter too much, but the actual transforms that we use are important. They have to match what we're going to use over on R1. So we use AES-256 for encryption and SHA for data integrity. Next, let's create an IPsec profile that will go ahead and include that transform set. So our profile is called P2P-Profile, and when used, it's going to use transform set P2P-Set. On R3, we'll create a tunnel interface, and we're going to specify tunnel mode IPsec IPv4. We're also going to tell this interface on R3 that we want to use IPN numbered and use the local IP address on loopback 0. We'll specify the tunnel source is our serial 1 slash 0 on R3, and that the destination is 15001. That is the IP address that's reachable over at R1. And our last step for this tunnel interface would be to apply that IPsec profile that we just created. And that is a very positive sign that the tunnel came up. So now on R3, let's add on top of that the EIGRP routing protocol for Autonomous System 777. We'll include the 10 networks and the 3 networks. That will include R3's local network of 1033, as well as its loopback address. And this is also a very good sign that our neighborship has just come up between R1 and R3. 
Now, when it comes to troubleshooting, if something doesn't go quite right, where do we look? Well, one thing we could look at is the Ike Phase 1 tunnel. Did it ever establish? We could do a show crypto isokemp essay, and that would show us whether or not you and I have a working Ike Phase 1 tunnel. If we're trying to build an IPsec security association and Ike Phase 1 isn't working, we're never going to get to Ike Phase 2. So this is a good first step. Another command that I enjoy is the show crypto engine connection active. That's going to give us a bird's eye view of our Ike phase one and Ike phase two tunnels that we have in place. So here we have our Ike phase one and these top two represent the IPsec tunnel, which is two unidirectional tunnels, an outbound and an inbound security association between R1 and R3. We saw the neighborship come up, so we assume that we have an EIGRP neighborship, but we could do a show IP EIGRP neighbors just to confirm that. If we want to see any EIGRP learn routes, we'll do a show IP route EIGRP. So from our three's perspective, the 10.1.1 network is showing up as an EIGRP learn route. We also have learned about the loopback address of R1 because it's included in EIGRP as well. And to verify our connectivity, we can do a ping all the way over to 10.1.1.1, which is the interface address on R1 on the 10.1.1 subnet. We could source it from our 10.3.3 subnet address to verify full connectivity back and forth between R1 and R3. I have had a great time in this video. I'm so glad you joined me for it. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.